Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Welcome to a special Saturday edition of our show. It's 10 o'clock in the morning here on the East Coast of the United States. Scott Ritter will be with us in just a moment over the tumultuous events going on inside Russia. Is Yevgeny Prigozhin attempting a coup against President Putin? Can the Wagner Group, the Wagner Group however, however you pronounce it, actually take over the government? What are they trying to accomplish right after this? You want to feel safe in your vehicle. And for you, that means easy, rapid access to your firearm. But safety also means your items don't fall into the wrong hands. You don't have to choose between safety and convenience. The Headrest Safe keeps your firearm where you can access it, and no one else can. Just order your Headrest Safe, install it yourself when it arrives, and enjoy peace of mind. It starts at theheadrestsafe.com. Scott, thank you for your time uh, on a Saturday morning and for all your expertise on this uh, troubling matter, which seems to be uh, unfolding uh, right before our eyes. I want to start by playing for you a clip that's only a few minutes old uh, from Sky News and the uh, reporter citing Reuters sources and with some uh, film. Uh, shows uh, Wagner troops in the city of Rostov. And then about two-thirds of the way through this report, which is just about a minute long, says that Russian troops have set up a machine gun nest in Moscow. So take a listen and then your analysis. New footage that we've just received in the early hours of this morning. Uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, Wagner's leader, moved troops into the Russian city of Rostov on Don. These are new pictures of uh, his troops uh, moving into the city, we understand. He claims to have taken control of key military facilities uh, in Rostov-on-Don, that city in the south of Russia, not far from the Ukrainian border and where the Russian military operation is being run from these pictures that are just coming into us uh, at Sky News. Also hearing from the Reuters news agency that Russian soldiers have been setting up a machine gun position on the southwest edge of Moscow. This is according to photographs published by the Vodomosti newspaper. Uh, photographs on uh, local media also showing armed police gathering at the point where the M4 highway um, is uh, heading towards Moscow and where the Wagner mercenaries are moving along in a convoy. Okay, so giving that some credence, uh, what's your take on what's happening in Russia as we speak? Well, first of all, this is a very serious turn of events. Um, <clears throat> Evgeny uh, Primakov, who is the public face of the Wagner uh, private military contract group, uh, who has achieved uh, some uh, prominence as a um, capable combat unit, given their performance uh, in Bakhmut, the uh, bloody battle, the so-called meat grinder that uh, killed 75,000 Ukrainian soldiers at a cost of 30,000 of Wagner lives. Um, it appears that he has turned his forces on Russia, on the Russian government, on Vladimir Putin himself, uh, ostensibly uh, done to um, target uh, uh, Shoigu, the defense minister, and Gerasimov, the uh, the head of the uh, Russian general staff, uh, two people that uh, Prigozhin has had a very vocal and public uh, feud with um, for many months now. Um, he claimed initially that he wasn't targeting the president, that he was simply doing his patriotic duty to, uh, to seek the removal of these two corrupt and ineffective uh, people. But um, Vladimir Putin gave a speech earlier today uh, where he made it clear that what he felt about what Prigozhin and Wagner were doing, he called them traitors. Um, and after that speech, uh, Prigozhin turned his sights on uh, Putin. So let's be clear, this is a, an armed insurrection, a coup d'etat being orchestrated by uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin using the combat forces of a private military contractor uh, to forcibly remove the constitutionally um, <clears throat> mandated uh, and instituted government of Russia. Mm -hmm. um, I will say this, that uh, events have gone far beyond what Sky News is reporting. Uh, Wagner troops have uh, pushed through the city of Vorin, uh, Vorinezh and are heading towards Moscow. They're being actively engaged by Russian air 
Uh, helicopters are destroying Wagner vehicles on the highway. Uh, this isn't a machine gun nest that's being established out of Moscow. Thousands, tens of thousands of troops are being assembled, including heavy armor, artillery. Um, and Putin has basically said, take the gloves off, put this thing down and put it down now. Uh, the Chechen forces, the Ahmad special forces are being sent to Rostov right now. Um, this is not a situation that's going to last very long. It will be violently suppressed or at least attempted to be. Uh, Wagner made certain assumptions. Prigozhin made certain assumptions. So what a lot of people didn't know is that two days ago, prior to this, the Ukrainian uh, uh, intelligence service, um, they had a, uh, a, a series of um, covert cells that were being positioned in Moscow were uncovered by the FSB, Russian security, and rounded up. It appears that these cells were supposed to be in place in Moscow so that as Prigozhin began to move towards Moscow, they would carry out a series of attacks, explosions, terrorist events that would terrorize the Russian people, reinforce the notion that Putin was an ineffective leader, and therefore the people of Moscow would welcome Wagner with open arms. This is a concerted effort between Wagner, the Ukrainian intelligence service, and their Western sponsors, in particular the British, to achieve uh, what they've always been looking for, which is what they call a Moscow Maidan moment. We've discussed this. The only way that Ukraine could possibly win this war is if Russia implodes. And uh, having been defeated on the battlefield, we see that, you know, kudos to them. They recruited Pogosian. There's no doubt in my mind that Yevgeny Pogosian is working on behalf of foreign intelligence services, carrying out their tasks, and that task is to collapse the government of uh, Vladimir Putin. I personally believe that he won't succeed, but that's what's happening this morning. Are among uh, those uh, foreign intelligence services the CIA? Of course, the CIA is there, but I think the lead agency here is uh, is the British intelligence, if for no other reason that it, um, look, we have to confront the fact that Joe Biden is not fully there right now. Right. And to carry out something like this, the CIA would need um, presidential findings that would have to be articulated to Congress. And I don't think our commander in chief is positioned to do that. So the CIA, I believe, is providing uh, a supporting role to the British who have taken the lead on this because their system is a little bit more competent. At this point. Um, before, uh, before we get to what President Putin said uh, last night, at the same time that this is happening, uh, the president of Belarus uh, fled the country. Is there also a Wagner instigated or CIA supported or both coup going on there? Well, first of all, the president of Belarus has not fled the country. That's a uh... That's fake information. There's also information that Putin has fled Moscow, running to uh, St. Petersburg. That's fake information as well. Uh, look, what we have right now, in addition to what Wagner is doing, which is very real, we have an information war being played right now. And social media uh, has been hijacked by pro-Ukrainian, pro-British, pro-CIA uh, channels who right now are in the business of putting out rumor, putting out speculation, uh, creating, um, un, you know, creating chaos and anarchy in the information spectrum to sow confusion amongst various populations, including, in particular, the Russian population. The idea is to create the perception of a government in collapse. Okay. Um, okay. We have to treat almost everything we hear on social media with a heavy grain of salt. Right. Understood. Uh, what, would it be reasonable to conclude that Putin knew about this ahead of time? I mean, Russian intelligence is pretty effective, is it not? I would not be surprised that Putin was briefed on the possibility of this. So one of the problems that exists today is that this is a problem of, in many ways, Putin's own creation. Um, How the, so? The, well, the conflict between Prigozhin and Shoigu has been bubbling up for months now. If you remember back when uh, when uh, Prigozhin was talking about the uh, they were denying me artillery shells, we had that discussion. Right. We don't have enough artillery shells. It's Shoigu's fault. The corruption of Shoigu denying me artillery shells. Now, some people said, well, that was just a psyop, a psychological operation designed to suck the Ukrainians in. And Prigozhin later came out and said, yeah, it was just a psyop. I was making this stuff up. 
But the people I talked to, I was in Russia, said, no, man, this is real. This is a problem. While I was in Russia, Putin had to call Shoigu and Prigozhin into his office and read them the riot act and tell them to knock it off, stop this, cease and desist. But in a reflection of perhaps the legitimacy of Prigozhin's position, he told Shoigu to take a back seat and appointed General Surovikin to be General Armageddon uh, to be the principal point of contact. This legitimized uh, Prigozhin's position. It gave credence to the notion that Shoigu is the problem, not Prigozhin. How well not respected? How well respected in the political, international, diplomatic, and military community? It's a mouthful. Uh, is Shoigu, the the defense minister, is he a political hack or is he a serious uh, manager of defense forces? Well, he's not a military expert. He's a management uh, expert. Look, um, Shoigu's been loyal to Putin from day one. Uh, he and Putin have been colleagues uh, and compatriots uh, since Putin became president. So there's a significant history there. And as you know, in politics, um, that kind of uh, of comfort, um, you know, breeds you know confidence. Um, Shoigu helped create something called the Ministry of Emergency Response in Russia, and this ministry uh, has succeeded beyond anybody's wildest expectations. So the idea that he's a hack is absurd in the extreme. He's okay. somebody who has created something, made it work. Now, the problem is. Russia's at war right now, and Shoigu's not a military man with combat experience. And there are many people who take advantage of this, who criticize him, sometimes with justification for his lack of military knowledge. Uh, people such as Prigozhin, who, by the way, has no military experience whatsoever, but he capitalizes on the fact that Wagner is a highly competent unit that has a council of commanders who are some of the most experienced military experts in Russia who do the fighting, do the winning, and then Prigozhin takes credit. Here's, uh, here's Prigozhin uh, on May 5th. Now, this is that um, furious, over-the-top furious uh, complaint that he made where he purports to point over his shoulder at what he said are dead uh, Wagner fighters, and the reason they're dead is because Shoigu wouldn't give uh, Wagner the ammunition uh, they uh, they need. Here we go. Now listen to me, you effing bees and those bastards who are not giving us any effing ammunition. We'll be in hell munching on their whatever. We have a 70% shortage of ammunition. Shoigu, Gerasimov. Where the blank is the ammunition? Where is it? This is that uh, fury that he announced. Now, here he is yesterday in Rostov. Когда мы пришли сюда, то мы еще раз подтвердили много новое. Огромное количество территорий потеряно. Солдат убитых. 3-4 раза больше, чем это документов подается наверх. А то, что подается, это в 10 раз меньше, чем говорят по телевизору. Санитарные потери в день составляют между 1 до 1000 человек. Это убитые, без вести пропавшие, раненые и так называемые отказники, которые отказываются не потому, что они с трусами, я уже говорил, а потому что у них выхода нет, боеприпасов нет, управления нет. Начальник генерального штаба бежал отсюда, как только узнал о том, что мы подходим к зданию. Well, here's the here's the problem with Prigozhin's statement. Um, first of all, you know, I can't. First of all, I have no way of double checking what he claims is access to documents, and he's saying, um, but he didn't provide the documents. So let's realize that. If he had the documents, why aren't they published? What we do know is he made other statements where he's very specific about where the Ukrainians had broken through, where they had advanced. And in the aftermath of this, Russian soldiers who were fighting there have put out their own videos saying, hey, Prigozhin, we're here. It's quiet. There's no Ukrainians. So Prigozhin right now is literally reading from a script prepared by the Ukrainians. These are Ukrainian talking points. These are the same points that the CIA MI6 have been making, making one of Russian incompetence. If you look at the front line right now, 
There is no talk about a Ukrainian breakthrough. Every Russian unit is saying, we're in control. We're in charge. We're winning. Okay, uh, we're going to take a break for about 30 seconds. When we come back, we'll hear what President uh, Putin had to say last night uh, when he addressed uh, the nation, and Scott will uh, analyze that. And we'll also ask a few more questions about uh, Wagner. Uh, who are they? Where do they come from? What do they want? Are they Russians? And how many of them are there? All that right after this. You want to feel safe in your vehicle. And for you, that means easy, rapid access to your firearm. But safety also means your items don't fall into the wrong hands. You don't have to choose between safety and convenience. The Headrest Safe keeps your firearm where you can access it, and no one else can. Just order your Headrest Safe, install it yourself when it arrives, and enjoy peace of mind. It starts at theheadrestsafe.com. Uh, let's play, uh, well, welcome back, of course. Let's play uh, a clip from President Putin's five-minute address to the Russian people on Friday evening. I spoke again last night with the commanders on all fronts. I also addressed those who have been hit or coerced into a criminal adventure, driven onto the path of a crime, an armed rebellion. Россия сегодня ведет тяжелейшую борьбу за свое будущее, отражает агрессию неонацистов и их хозяев. Против нас направлена фактически вся военная, экономическая, информационная машина Запада. Любые распри, которыми могут воспользоваться и пользуются наши внешние враги, чтобы подорвать нас изнутри. И потому действия, которые раскалывают наше единство, это, по сути, отступничество от своего народа. От боевых товарищей, которые сражаются сейчас на фронте. Это удар в спину нашей стране и нашему народу. Все, кто сознательно встал на путь предательства, кто готовил вооруженный мятеж, встал на путь шантажа и террористических методов, понесут неименуемое наказание. Inescapable punishment. Have you seen him so serious? Well, I mean, I've seen uh, Vladimir Putin serious before, but you know, he's never been confronted with an armed rebellion. Uh, this is a very serious thing, um, and if it um, spirals out of control, uh, could threaten the survival of Russia, which, of course, is what it's intended to do. Um, so, when he says, uh, when he talks about serious punishment, uh, understand this. Um, this doesn't end until Wagner is destroyed. This doesn't end until Yevgeny Primakov is dead or in prison. Wagner is not going to win. There was a gamble made. Uh, they, they needed several things to happen, such as, for instance, they needed the Russian nation and the people to rally around them. Wagner was going off of the reputation they had built uh, through the battles of Solodar and Bakhmut, achieving victory uh, at a time when many Russians were starting to question whether or not victory could be attained in the special military operation, Wagner, Wagner gave them that victory, a dramatic victory, a decisive victory. And so Wagner was lauded as heroes, superheroes, the epitome of the Russian fighting man, the Russian fighting spirit. Wagner, all over Russia, there are recruiting posters put up in every city for Wagner to sign people up as Wagner is, was regrouping ostensibly. This morning, all those recruiting posters are being torn down. The Wagner Center in St. Petersburg, um, the head of their information um, propaganda aspect has been occupied by Russian security forces. And um, Putin has signed a warrant for Prigozhin's arrest and has mobilized the army and given them orders to use all means necessary to stop this. So this will end sooner rather than later. Let's just understand what Wagner is and isn't. They're a small group of highly professional for that's so a small. I mean, how, how many like, fighters, Scott? Sorry for interrupting. How many no human beings are we talking about on on Wagner's side? Well, according to Prigozhin, he has twenty five thousand. But I'll tell you what, I think that's exaggerated. He uh, that's twenty five thousand total, but some are here, there, and everywhere. The number of troops that he's probably moved into Russia numbers in the you know four to five thousand uh, number. Um, and here's the other interesting thing, you know, in the lead up to this, uh, you had the Ukrainians. If you remember, the Ukrainians used some Russian nationalist units uh, 
backed by Ukraine intelligence to attack into the Bo Belgorod area, to cross the border, attack villages and create the perception of a weak Russia. Who is the number one person coming in and saying, this proves Putin's weak, this proves Shoigu's ineffective, this proves Grasimov is incompetent, Prigozhin. And what did he say he was going to do? I will move Wagner on my own volition, he said, to Belgorod to save Russia. Many of the Wagner fighters who have gone into Belgorod were told that they're going there not to attack Putin, not to attack Shoigu, but to protect Russia from the Ukrainians. And they've arrived here and they're going, what the hell is going on here? Why are we doing this? And the Ministry of Defense is saying, telling them, lay down your weapons. I'm telling you right now, by the time this day is done, the majority of the Wagner fighters will probably have laid down their weapons voluntarily because they're Russian patriots, they're Russian heroes. They don't want to be involved in an armed insurrection against a Russian president named Vladimir. Doesn't this tool of MI6 and the CIA, you have Jenny Prigozhin, know that he is vastly outnumbered and that many of his own people will desert him for the reasons you just articulated. Well, I think he was told, led to believe by the Ukrainian intelligence services and the British intelligence that Putin's um, government is a house of cards. And they, they told him, I believe they told him, that the oligarchs would rally around him. That as soon as he crossed the border and made a move towards Moscow, that the governors and the mayors would all come out and say, we're behind Yevgeny, we're behind Wagner, we demand Shoigu's removal. That the oligarchs would say, we're throwing our weight behind them. And then there would have been this uh, insurrection in Moscow by Ukrainian intelligence blowing things up, where the people of Moscow would have said, holy cow, Putin is weak. Wagner come in and save us. He was led to believe that all of this would take place. None of it's taking place. Instead, the Russian soldiers trying to avoid civil war have said, okay, you're coming in. Uh, we're here, but what are you doing? We're not too happy about this. The Russian generals are saying, guys, this is pretty stupid. Put down your weapons. They kept moving towards Moscow. And now they're getting hammered. And the reality is going to sink home real soon. It hadn't already to these Wagner fighters that they're on the wrong side of history here, that they're going to be forever known, not as the heroes of Bakhmut, but the traitors who sold out their country to a Ukrainian Nazi enemy backed by the collective West, which is just seeking the destruction of the nation they're supposed to be defending. Whew. Scott Ritter, can't thank you uh, enough, my dear friend. Uh, it's, it's so good of you to provide all this information for us on a, a Saturday morning, a very eventful uh, Saturday morning. Well, thanks for having me. Always, always great. Well, if you like what you saw, like, subscribe, and tell a friend. We're trying to hit that 175,000 uh, mark of subscriptions by Independence Day, the 4th of July, which is soon coming upon us. We will soon be back as, uh, as events uh, develop. I'm happy and thrilled that so many of you watch us uh, and want and yearn for this information, which you might not be able to get anywhere else. Or as we get it, Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom. You want to feel safe in your vehicle with access to your firearm that's both secure and convenient. The Headrest Safe keeps your firearm where you can access it and no one else can. It starts at theheadrestsafe.com. Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Friday, June 23rd, 2023. It's about 2.35 in the afternoon here on the East Coast of the United States. Colonel Douglas McGregor with us in a moment on who's winning that vaunted spring offensive. And Yevgeny Prigozhin's, you won't believe this, latest explosion Accusing, accusing the Kremlin of lying as a pretext for war. Colonel McGregor's opinions on all of that right after this. When it comes to carrying valuables or even firearms in your vehicle, most people feel they have to choose between safety and convenience. A vehicle break-in occurs every 36 seconds in America. The Headrest Safe gives you the power to store cash, jewelry, medication, and yes, even your concealed carry firearm. You'll never have to worry about taking your valuables with you again. Keep them safe with the Headrest Safe. Use promo code JUDGENAP and enjoy $50 off for a limited time at theheadrestsafe.com. Colonel, always a pleasure, my dear friend. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. 
What what is the uh, status of the so-called spring offensive now at the end of June? I think the kindest thing that can be said at this point is that the defensive phase, in a strategic sense, of Russian operations is coming to a close. Uh, tragically, the Ukrainians have done virtually exactly what the Russians would have written for them and hurled themselves against impregnable defenses that they cannot possibly win against. They've never come to terms, and I don't think for that matter anyone in the West has come to terms, with the importance of uh, the links between intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, particularly persistent reconnaissance and firepower. And uh, the Russians understand this probably better than anyone. They've used it very effectively to the point where I know President Putin recently said that he thought that the Ukrainians had lost 13,000 killed. My sources say at least 15,000 with as many wounded. So I think uh, when the epitaph for the Ukrainian army is written, it will be written on the basis of this final phase from Bakhmut to counteroffensive. So is it fair to say that the, the three defensive rings, which you characterized for us uh, uh, before uh, today, that even the first one, the one closest to the Ukrainian troops, has, has not been breached by the Ukrainian troops, even reached no, they, they've they've never, you're right, Judge. They've never reached the main defensive belt. They've moved into the security zone on a couple of occasions, which, of course, is the area chosen by the Russians to annihilate the force in detail before it reaches the defense. So it, this is over. Uh, the question is, what is next? You uh, mentioned uh, the yeah. Russian advantage in reconnaissance. Do, do not the Ukrainians have uh, American reconnaissance to rely on? I think they do. In fact, I know they do. But I don't think they have the level of precision fire connected in, a, in an automatic sense to overhead surveillance. In other words, the ability to see something that you want to strike and within the space of a minute or two, uh, annihilating that target. That kind of rapidity of response is something that's lacking on the Ukrainian side. I, I think it's lacking on the NATO side. Here's... Um Here's what the Department of Defense, they have a new spokesperson, uh, Dr. Deborah Singh, I think her first name's Deborah, I might yeah. be wrong, um, made a statement uh, yesterday, which is the usual cheery uh, optimism, but um, anxious to hear your comments on it. I think our assessments have been pretty um, clear from the beginning. I think, you know, we, we know, as you continue to see the fight, that it continued to move to the east, it's become more of a grinding battle um, every day. Um, you saw that in Bakhmut. Uh, the Ukrainians can speak to their operations and, and, um, and more to the day-to-day -day on what's happening on the ground, but we know this is going to be a hard fight. Uh, we know this is going to take time, and um, we are confident that the Ukrainians have what they need. Um, they have the combat power. Uh, they have the ability um, to be successful in their in their counteroffensive operations. We see them launching both defensive and offensive operations right now. Um, but I would let them speak to to more of that. Okay, it's uh, uh, Dr. Sabrina Singh. My apologies for getting her first name wrong. But does she know what she's talking about? <laughs> Judge, we we increasingly utilize women as spokespersons. And the reason for that is that uh, the journalists and, and tough-minded individuals that may still reside in the media are unwilling to ask women hard questions. They don't want to embarrass the women. They don't want to come across as impolite. God forbid that they should be termed uh, toxic masculine types. So that's part of the problem. Second thing is this woman has a pedigree that goes all the way back to Hillary Clinton. Mm. She's been a Democratic operative for many years, which means that she can lie without compunction. And she did so very effectively here. Uh, this is this is uh, not to, not surprising in the least, and it's become standard fare inside the Beltway. Does she really understand anything? You know, I have no idea. But lying without compunction is a precondition for rising in the current Washington environment. I mean, it's almost criminal uh, the substantial and material deceptions that uh, she offered, and in my opinion, it's. Is there such a thing as journalistic malpractice? Who knows? 
for, for the media to just pick it up uncritically and not to challenge her, whether it's because she's a woman or for whatever reason. Well, the media is part of it. I mean, let's be let's be frank. Uh, the media is dominated by people who are 100 percent behind this war to destroy Russia. Uh, the whole war began as a lie and it continues as a lie. It will end tragically for the people that are the most vulnerable. That is the Ukrainians. It will end badly, I think, for any Europeans that continue to support it. Hopefully we will not be dragged in. But the bottom line is it's one lie after the next. The Russians will ultimately establish the truth, and that will be hard to conceal when it's finally revealed. Well, uh, here's uh, your uh, former colleague, I think you know him, uh, retired uh, General Ben Hodges, uh, on what he thinks should happen next. Ukraine needs long-range precision weapons, and, and I'm, very, I'm very frustrated that the, my, our administration has so far refused to provide the ATACMs and uh, other long-range precision weapons, which would uh, help Ukraine hit Russian targets in Crimea. Because at the end of the day, Crimea is the decisive terrain. As long as Russia occupies Crimea, Ukraine will never be safe, and Ukraine will never be able to rebuild its economy. So Crimea is the decisive terrain. And if the U.S. would provide these long-range weapons to Ukraine, then the Russians would have to begin to leave Crimea. Well, first of all, Judge, I do not know uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. I think he said he was class of 80 at West Point. <clears throat> and like uh, Petraeus and many others, he has joined in uh, to, substantial, to a substantial extent to push lies about this entire conflict. And I, th I think in professional terms, the kindest thing I can say about him and Petraeus for that matter, is that these people are professional pygmies. They don't seem to understand the gravity of what their- What was the word you used, Colonel? Pygmies? Pygmies, yes. In, in, in general terms, these, these people are not serious professional soldiers. To make those kinds of suggestions is to invite a much wider and more destructive war. Yes. He also doesn't bother to point out, and of course we never do, in the West that thus far, uh, President Putin has actually held back the Russian military. The Russian military can do an infinitely more serious amount of damage than it has to thus far. Putin has never wanted to kill large numbers of Ukrainians. He has been very mindful from the very beginning that it, at some point in the future, he he's going to want to live with the people that he's been fighting and he does not want to inflict unnecessary damage. We've left him no choice. And as we've done in the past, we've said, you know, you can do one of two things. You, you Russians can either leave Ukraine or commit suicide. Uh, those are the only options. And if you don't choose those, then we will fight you until there are none of you left. Under those circumstances, uh, he's had to persevere. And he's done so very effectively. But the Russian military has never really unleashed its full power. You uh, sent me a piece in one of our many... Uh uh, email exchanges, for which, of course, I am deeply and personally and professionally uh, grateful. Um, it wasn't written by you, but it just startled me. And it basically said the war will end when a Ukrainian military commander on the battlefield surrenders to a Russian military commander on the battlefield because the Ukrainian military and political leadership will either be dead or will have left Ukraine. Do you subscribe uh, to that doomsday scenario, Colonel? Well, if we insist on stonewalling the Russians, if we continue to live in fantasy world and drag the Ukrainians down this path with us, uh, we'll all end up in hell together. <clears throat> and I think that's what the message is. The Russians will now move forward. Now, will they do it next week or July? Or will it come at the beginning of August? I have no idea, but they're in a position now to launch a punishing offensive. There have already been some offensive moves up near Lyman and uh, towards Zaborysha. I would expect the Russian military to sweep across the rest of eastern Ukraine and then cross and seize Odessa. So I think those things will happen. The question is, what are we going to do in the meantime? Are we going to talk to the Russians? Or are we going to establish some sort of arrangement based on reality, based on the facts? Are we finally going to recognize their legitimate security interests? I mean, I thought it was interesting that 
uh, Hodges said, well, as long as the Russians are in Ukraine, or excuse me, in, in Crimea, Ukraine will never be safe. Well, as far as the Russians are concerned, as long as you have this NATO-backed government or Washington puppet in Kiev with a large army at its disposal in Ukraine, they will never be safe. So the question is, how do, we, how do we satisfy everyone's security needs? And the answer has always been the same neutrality. The question is, what's going to be left of Ukraine? The longer we wait, the more likely it is that Russian troops will stand on the Polish border. Those are facts. Right. Uh, we'll take a break. Uh, when we come back, another outburst from Yevgeny Prigozhin, a very, very strong, typical Prigozhin outburst for Colonel McGregor to analyze right after this. The headrest safe is quick and easy to use. Some may even call it a game changer. The headrest safe acts as a safety net, protecting your belongings while keeping them out of sight and out of bounds of others, serving as security while also keeping your valuables in bounds. That's what the headrest safe provides for me. Game, set, match. So, uh, Colonel, welcome back. Um, um, Mr. Prigozhin issued another one of his outbursts. This is about a 30-minute, we're not going to play the whole thing. This is about a 30-minute, uh, appears to be extemporaneous statement he made hmm. uh, on, his own, um, on his own Telegram uh, channel. But the first one references that we've uh, excerpted from it, leopards, tanks. And since you're a former tank commander, we'll play that first. And then the second one is more, more <coughs> big picture. But, but first, his reference to uh, 60 leopards destroyed and the monstrous lies surrounding the report of their destruction. What we are being told is a profound deception. And we will face the fact only when, as was the case on Krasny Lehman, as was the case in Kherson, as was the case in many other places, a bunch of these scum, realizing that they have already lost a huge piece of territory, gather and declare that they have regrouped the more advantageous positions. The same thing is happening in Bakhmut. The enemy is getting deeper, deeper and deeper into our defenses. The enemy saves his soldiers. The enemy saves his equipment. All that the enemy doesn't save is ammunition, and that's why our soldiers die and leave with injuries. Time is rapidly collapsing. All right, that's not the one in which he mentions uh, the leopards, but it makes it sound like he thinks the Ukrainians are winning. Even if he believes that, why say it in public? What does he gain by that? Is he running for president of Russia? Well, I don't think uh, that he believes the Ukrainians are winning. I don't think that's his point. I think he's expressing frustration with uh, the Russian high command that they have not already launched uh, decisive offensive operations. And why? His attitude is if you allow the Ukrainians to survive this phase in any form, if you allow them to withdraw, history teaches that they will try to regroup, that they may receive new weapons from the West, and we've got to fight it all over again. So I think his view is, <clears throat> let's get this over with. Let's attack decisively, crush what's left, and that will do more to save Russian lives than anything else. I do, think they, do they fear um, a long-standing guerrilla war, and thus they want to destroy as many soldiers as they can? Well, I think that's in the back of his mind, and I think others in, in Moscow are considering that. Again, this goes back to the question of what, what do you have left when this is over? Right. And if you want to negotiate an end to the war, you've got to have strict neutrality. Otherwise, you, you see something in the uh, sort of vein of uh, Kosovo resurfacing in Ukraine, where you're going to have the enemy come back again and again and again. I think he's worried about that. And, you know, he has his reasons to feel that way because he also knows Ukrainians are very tenacious fighters. Let, let there be no doubt about it. The Ukrainians are good soldiers. The ones we're facing now, or he's facing at this point, are probably the least well-trained that, that he's seen since this war began. If you're leading uh, an offensive against a well-entrenched adversary, do you lead with your best troops 
or your newest troops? Well, if you have to do what they've done, and uh, I don't think they had to, but unfortunately made the decision to do it under great pressure, you really do have to use your best troops, the people that are most accustomed to operating under fire. Having soldiers that have been under fire before is helpful because they know what can and can't happen. They have a, a more uh, sober-minded view of the operation. The problem with this entire thing from day one is that even if you brought in the United States Army in great, in great numbers and you said breach this defense, it would take substantial Air Force as well as Army capabilities to work on it for months. It would not come quickly. So the Ukrainians never had a snowball's chance in hell, frankly, of breaking through these defenses, not in any span of time that we demanded. You mentioned the advantage of uh, experienced soldiers, and of course you yourself have much experience under fire. Uh, is it instinctual? Is it like uh, muscle memory that you just, you just instinctually know what to do at the, at the right moment? on the basis of having been there before? All discipline is a form of habit. Much depends on how rigorously and frequently you have trained. And you have to train uh, on a scale that we rarely do in peacetime so that you reach a point where it comes naturally to do what is right and what makes sense. Now, you just said, uh, for a soldier like me, well, I'm out of date. You have to have people that have been fighting in this war that have developed an appreciation for Russian capabilities, for the missiles, for the rockets, for the artillery, for the tanks and armored fighting vehicles, mines, and so forth. Understand Russian tactics, understand where they set up and why. Uh, you know, for instance, today it was reported that uh, HIMARS had supposedly destroyed a, a Russian rocket artillery battery, a Grad missile battery. And we can't find much evidence that they destroyed the battery, but there was a huge explosion, so we assume they did. The more, more that we look at, the more convinced we are that this was to entice the Ukrainians into firing more ammunition so that their batteries could be targeted. Mm. So my point is the Russians are competent. They mm -hmm. were never stupid, and you have to understand that. And I think there, there may not be as many people on hand now as there were a year ago to, to fathom that and appreciate it. Uh, Gary, play the uh, other clip, please, from uh, Mr. Prigozhin. No one destroyed 60 leopards. This is total nonsense. Shoigu leaves according to the principle that to be believed, the lie must be monstrous. And that's why deceptions happen. Two realities. No one destroyed 60 leopards. Shoigu, that's the Russian Minister of Defense, uh, operates under the principle, I think I'm fairly uh, summarizing this, that to be believed, the lie must be monstrous. Have 60 leopards been destroyed? First of all, what's a leopard? Uh, and, and secondly, again, why attack Shoigu by name like this? Uh, the leopard tank is the standard tank weapon of the German army. Now, I don't know what kinds of leopards he's referring to because there are different variations. There's the Leopard 1, the Leopard 2, Leopard 4, and so forth. I didn't know that there were 60 leopards on the battlefield. I knew that there were at least 16 to 25, maybe more have shown up. What we can say with absolute certainty is that the Ukrainians have lost almost 280 tanks, perhaps uh, three or 400 other armored fighting vehicles, as well as the... 15,000 dead. That's absolutely certain. Secondly, on Shoigu... Excuse Shoigu, me for interrupting. Just yeah. in the offensive. Yes, just in this offensive. I don't know how many of them are leopard tanks. I don't know. I don't think it makes much difference because the way things are set up right now, you could destroy almost anything on that battlefield because of the links that I explained earlier between persistent surveillance and almost immediate precision fires. When do you think the uh, neocons in the State Department, Mrs. Newland, uh, and the politicians uh, in the in the West Wing, who somehow think that President Biden can be reelected, uh, will recognize they need an off ramp, or stated differently, will recognize that Ukraine can't win this, cannot win this? Remember, ideologues, or let's go back to the beginning. Ideology is a secular variant of religion. Uh, these are true believers in the ideology and the ideology of militant liberal democracy, uh, wokeism, 
uh, combine it with globalism, internationalism, all bound up as one, is something they fervently believe, and they're certain that it will bring them victory. Uh, I don't think you're going to convince them of much of anything unless you were to suit them up and put them on the battlefield, which I think has very little chance of ever occurring. <laughs> so I think they're going to fight it to the last Ukrainian. So I don't see much evidence there. The, the only thing I did want to say, though, is about Shoigu. Shoigu is not a professional soldier. He was appointed as Minister of Defense for a whole range of reasons. He has a long record of competence in action. He's someone that President Putin trusts. And I think Shoigu is somebody who is cautious. And if Prigozhin is upset about anything, it's the extent to which the Russian military has been so deliberate and cautious. Okay, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to him because if I were sitting where he is with the kinds of forces that I know the Russians have, then I would say, let's not waste any more time. Let's pull the trigger and get this over with. So I, I'm sympathetic to his views. But, uh, you know, Shoigu has done a good job. He's performed well. Gerasimov is highly competent. Everything has gone down well. If you look at the balance of casualties, Russian casualties are very, very light. They've been very successful. And President Putin's intent of not killing large numbers of Ukrainians, if it can be avoided, has actually been adhered to. So I, I understand how he feels, but I think it's a, a bigger picture than, than he realizes. Colonel McGregor, always a pleasure, my dear friend. Thank you very much for sharing your time and your thoughts with us. Sure. Thank you, Judge. Of course. More as we get it. If you like what you saw, like, subscribe, and tell a friend. We're very close to that 175,000 subscribers by the 4th of July, which will soon be upon us. Judge Napolitano for Judging Freedom. You want to feel safe in your vehicle with access to your firearm that's both secure and convenient. The Headrest Safe keeps your firearm where you can access it and no one